Hello, steam team. Did you know there are over 500 species of bees in British Columbia alone? That's pretty wild and also very important. And today we're going to be talking about why. But first, welcome to Steam Team Tuesdays for the Backyard Bug Series. My name is Kristen and I'm a programming assistant at the Penticton Public Library. I'm very excited to be sharing with you this month some awesome activities that can help us learn more about the bugs right out in our own backyards and what we can do to attract them and help them out because there really is so much that they do for us. Okay, so for the first video in this series, as you may have guessed, we're going to be talking about bees. And I have my little bee friend here with me. So when you think about bees, what comes to mind? For a lot of us, it's probably honeybees. And these are bees that live in hives. But there's a whole other category of bees who do not live in hives. And they are called solitary bees. There's a couple of different types. Some solitary bees may make their nests in trees and some in holes in the ground. They are either called tunnel nesting or ground nesting bees. Solitary bees can also look quite different than a regular bee. So they may not be that bright yellow color like this that we often associate with bees. One type, for example, called mason bees can actually be a metallic blue and green color. So they might look even more like a fly than a bee. Some solitary bees don't even have stingers. They're typically more gentle bees because they don't have a queen bee that they're needing to protect. So why should we care about solitary bees like mason bees? All types of bees are pollinators, meaning that they help flowering plants in pollination. So as you see, I have this lovely flowering carnation plant here. This is just to use as an example of a plant that bees may help to pollinate. But actually, many flowering plants are food crops that we eat. And they bring us wonderful things like fruits, certain vegetables, nuts and seeds, and even materials like cotton that can be used for clothing, and hay like alfalfa, which is used to feed livestock. So it's very important that these plants get pollinated. And this is where bees come in to help. The bees fly around from flower to flower, spreading their pollen and this allows the flowering plants to create new seeds which then can grow into new plants. Solitary bees are some of the best pollinators of the bee world. Without bees like these, we wouldn't be able to have some of the foods that we know and love. So today we're going to be building a home that tunnel nesting bees can use to lay their eggs in. You can buy mason bee homes at many gardening centers and they're made out of wood. But it's also quite easy to make a mason bee home out of materials that you already have at your house. And here is an example of one that I have started. These are like the little tunnels that the mason bees will burrow into and lay their eggs and then they will seal the end of the tunnel off with some mud or dirt to keep the babies safe there throughout the winter. If you want to help give solitary bees in your area a place to lay their eggs, then join me in building this solitary bee home. To build a solitary bee home, you will need There are a couple of options for the base of your solitary bee home. You can either use a plastic bottle of some kind, or you can use an empty tin can or coffee can, which may be a little bit easier as you won't have to trim or cut off the neck part of the bottle, which will require some adult help. Then you will need some cardboard rolls, such as toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls, which you can then cut to size. Then for the next part, you're either going to need some paper straws, any that you can find at the dollar store. Again, these are just going to need to be trimmed down to size. Or you can actually make your own tunnels using brown paper bags. Then you will need a pen or pencil some white glue. You could also use a hot glue gun here to be a little more efficient with some adult supervision. Then you'll need some scissors. If you're using a plastic bottle, you will also need something sharp for an adult to cut it for you with. 
such as box cutters or an X-Acto knife. Be very careful with these. Okay, then you will need some string or cord or rope to hang up your bee home, some tape if you'd like to just secure the rope a little bit more, and optionally paint and a paintbrush. Now we are on to the steps. Step one. Choose the materials you are going to use for your solitary bee home. For the base of the bee home, as we mentioned, you can start with an empty plastic bottle or an empty tin can. As you can see, the one I've started here is using an empty plastic bottle that has been rinsed and dried out. Same thing with the tin can if you're using it, but then it's ready to go. If you are also using a plastic bottle, you will need some adult help to carefully slice the bottle in half or at least to remove the neck part of the bottle. So this is what I did, just placed it down on the table, carefully poked in the X-Acto knife and then worked my way around until I was able to remove the top part of the plastic bottle. As you can see, it's not perfect, but that's totally okay. As an optional step, if you're using a can, you can choose to paint the outside, such as with a nice bright yellow color, which will help to attract the bees, or you can use some patterned or colored paper to wrap around your tin can or bottle. Step two. Next, you will want some toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls cut into two or three. So as you can see, I've already done here. Begin placing as many paper towel rolls inside of your can or bottle as you can fit. You want them to fit nice and snugly so that if you turn your can or bottle upside down and even give it a little shake, they will not be able to fall out. That way, if the wind is blowing outside, you know that the home will be safe for the little baby bees inside. Step three. Now it's time to make the little burrows or tunnels where the bees can lay their eggs. If you have some plain paper straws on hand, they can be used as a very simple way of doing this. Otherwise, we will be using some brown paper bags to roll our own tunnels or nesting straws. So these are what we call nesting straws. And don't worry too much about what the size is. If you use straws that you bought, they may be a little smaller in diameter. And if you make your own, as I'll be showing you today with the brown paper bag, then they may be a little bit larger, but different species of the tunnel nesting bees will like different sizes. So they'll just choose what they like the best. So that's why today I'm going to be doing a bit of both. Okay, so to make the nesting straws out of the brown paper bags, measure the length of your can or of your bottle. So measure from the longest point of your bottle on the bottom to the edge of your toilet paper roll and make them that long to start off with. So then cut out rectangles from the paper bags that are as long as your can or bottle and about two inches wide. One by one, Wrap the paper rectangles around a round object, like a pen or pencil, and add a line of glue to one of the long sides of the paper, press it together, and remove your pen or pencil from the middle. Repeat this process until you have enough straws to fit snugly inside the toilet paper rolls in your can or bottle. You're going to want to let them dry for a little bit too. Using the pen or pencil is just to help as a guide, but you may be able to use your fingers as I'm doing here. As you can see, here's a few that I already made in advance, and they are varying sizes, which is totally okay. Step four. If you're using the paper straws, then you may not have to use this step, especially if you can get them to fit tightly enough. But if you're using the brown paper bag nesting straws that you've made yourself, then you may want to add some glue in there. So what you can do is add some white glue or wood glue to the bottom of your can or bottle and to the sides of the paper rolls. I will be demonstrating here using a paintbrush just to paint a light layer of glue on the sides. 
and then this will help to stick each of those nesting straws inside and have them stay in place. After you are finished, once again, let the glue dry completely. If any of the nesting straws are sticking out too far, trim them with scissors, just like this. Of course, if you're using these thicker straws, however, you may find that trimming them with scissors is very difficult. So once again, please get the help of an adult. What I did with these ones is I ended up just using a nice sharp serrated knife and I cut them off little by little, which was much easier than going through each one with scissors. Step five. So by now, your home should be nice and snug, filled with all the nesting straws, and we are ready to tie a string around it to get it ready to hang up outside. Tie a string around your bee home. I'm using some of this lovely blue cord and secure it with tape if needed. Make a loop at the end to be able to hang it outside somewhere and some good places to hang it are perhaps on a tree branch, near a wood pile, or on a fence. These are the places that the solitary bees, specifically the tunnel nesting bees, will be more likely to find it. And step six. Hang and admire your bee home. If hung in the spring, it may take a couple of months before the bees find it and create their nests, since that is usually done in mid to late summer. You will know that a mason bee has laid their eggs in there when you see one of the paper nesting straws filled with mud or dirt, as this is what they use to seal off these tunnels and keep their eggs safe. Some other tunnel nesting bees include carpenter bees who use chewed up wood to seal off their nesting tunnels and leaf cutter bees who use chewed up leaves for the same purpose, to seal off where they've laid their eggs. The eggs will stay there in the shelter through the winter, so make sure to leave your bee home outside as it is and then they will hatch the next spring. Yay! And now it is remix time! Do you love ladybugs? Well, my ladybug friend just had to come and say hello as well. And for a remix on this activity using many of the same materials, you can create a ladybug home. Now, ladybugs may not be pollinators like bees and butterflies, for example, but they can really help around the garden to keep away troublesome pests. Make a ladybug house by stacking some bamboo pieces or paper straws, as we did today, inside of an empty can, bottle, birdhouse, or even just a single paper roll. The ladybugs will use these little nooks and crannies to crawl around and hide in, and also to keep warmer when the weather is cold. You can hang this once again with string or place it anywhere that you would like, such as near the garden or wherever you'd like to house some bugs, as this may attract some other visitors as well who will take advantage of the shelter you have made. Check it out every once in a while to see what you observe. And now for a real world connection, let's get into a little deeper about how does pollination work? We'll be bringing out our bee friend again. So I will explain today this as the cookie jar effect. Flowering plants, such as this lovely carnation, attract pollinators for a number of reasons. Bees may like to collect pollen from the plants, which is full of protein that they can then take back to feed their young. And they're also attracted by the delicious, sweet-smelling nectar that flowers produce. So while the bees are at it, they're drinking the nectar, and some of the pollen from the flower is going to stick to their body, such as their belly or their legs, and then when they move on to another flower, perhaps a bit farther down, they will then be transferring the pollen to that flower, fertilizing that flower so that it can create seeds. So this is a great thing for the bee, which benefits from the pollen and the sweet nectar, and it's a great thing for the flowering plants, which get to spread their offspring and make more. But what does this have to do with cookies? What am I talking about when I say the cookie jar effect? So imagine you're reaching into a cookie jar, fumbling around to pull out a delicious cookie to eat. And after you're finished eating the cookie, you're probably left with crumbs, and unless you wash these crumbs off right away, 
they're going to transfer to the next thing that you touch, like your shirt or your hair, your a piece of paper. So think of these crumbs as pollen that's being transported from place to place, from one plant to another. Crumbs stick to our hands kind of like pollen sticks to bees. Alrighty guys, today we learned about solitary bees, what they are, and their contribution to pollination. With pollination being essential to many of the staple foods and other crops that we know, love, and rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we did is then put together a home for mason bees or other tunnel nesting solitary bees to nest in, which will help attract them to our yards and help keep the population of these bees going. I can't wait to try mine out this year. Next week, we will be talking about another wonderful pollinator, butterflies, such as what are butterflies' favorite kind of food? How can you attract these beautiful bugs into your yard? And what kind of butterflies do we have here locally in BC and specifically in the South Okanagan? Join me next week to craft a backyard butterfly feeder and learn more about all of these things. Thank you for joining me. Bye for now, STEAM team.